And to ask you this morning to turn with me to the book of Joel, the prophecy of Joel. We're going to look specifically at one verse in chapter 2, but before we turn to that, let me just tell you a little bit about the book. I'm not going to spend a long time on this because I want to get to the main point of the message. But Joel was a prophet, it's thought, who probably, not definitely, but probably lived round and about 800 years before the birth of Christ. And as you read through chapter 1 and then into chapter 2, it seems evident that Joel lived in a time when Israel was badly affected by locusts. Now, I don't know what you know about locusts, but if you look up locusts on, on the internet, I did this, and you turn to um, a website such as uh, National Geographic, very useful, if you want to know about <coughs> natural world. Locusts, um, they say, are creatures that normally live alone, but sometimes they swarm. And when they do that, you can get um, plagues of locusts or what's the word, swarms of locusts, um, anywhere between 40 and 80 million of them, imagine that, 40 or 80 million of these little creatures, and they swarm together in an area of no more than about half a square mile. And if you see the pictures on, on, the, on the screen there, it's like a thick cloud, and it, almost the, the sun gets darkened by this thick cloud of insects that are all swarming together. And when they do that and they move across the country, it's a devastating effect. And in the early chapters of, of this book of Joel, it seems that the, the, the locusts swarmed and they came across the land and they devastated all that was growing and that lay in their path. It speaks about the vines, and the fig trees and the crops all being destroyed and that meant that in the country there was no wine, there were no figs, there was no harvest, there was nothing that the people could bring as an offering unto God and the flocks and the herds were all starving because there was no foodstuff for them to eat. So this great natural disaster struck the land. But when you come to read these verses, it's evident that Joel, the prophet, recognises that there is a spiritual background to what has happened to the land. And he takes this as being what it actually is, as a sign of God's displeasure against Israel's sin. It's a judgement that comes from the Lord. And if you look at chapter 2 and verse 25, this becomes very plain. He refers to the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Now we think about this as being a natural disaster, but this is what God sent upon the people of Israel. And it was a sign of his displeasure. It was a token of his judgment against the people for their sin. But more than that, what Joel points out really here is that this is a warning, a warning of even more severe judgment unless the people turn from their sin in repentance and come to God. And he speaks about an invading force, not of locusts, but of, of an invading army. And Joel issues a whole series of warnings. And with the warnings come calls to repentance and upon repentance there are promises of mercy. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. That means warn people. The trumpet is always a warning sound. Blow the trumpet. Warn the people of what they're doing and how they're living, and that there will be a greater judgment to come if they do not listen to the word of God. But there's a warning followed by an invitation. Verse 12. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even unto me with all your heart and with fasting and weeping and mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great 
kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. So there's a warning and a call to repentance and a promise of mercy if the people will repent. Again in verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion. Another warning, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Speak to the people, in other words, and warn them of what will come if they do not um, repent and turn back to God. And then in verse 21, Fear not, O land, here's the promise, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. This is the mercy of God that's promised. Now here are lessons for us all. Sin reaps God's displeasure. It always does. It always does. And in the mercy of God, God issues warnings. Temporal judgments are warnings. You know when things go horribly wrong. It's a warning to us. It ought to be. We shouldn't just brush it to one side and we should ask ourselves, well, is there some way in which I have displeased the Lord? But what, when God gives his warnings, it's a mercy that he does that. And it should be taken in that kind of a way. Thank God that he doesn't just let us go on without warning us of the fact of our sin. And God calls us to repentance. And when we turn back to the Lord, he promises forgiveness and he promises to give us his blessing. That's always a great principle for life. So that's just by way of an introduction. But what I want us to look at this morning is verse 25. Joel chapter 2 and verse 25. I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. The years, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. We think about the years and we think about the years that the locust hath eaten and we think about the way that the Lord restores those years to those who turn to him. The years that the locust hath eaten. It's a timely message, isn't it? Always, every day. But especially as we come to the end of a year. No doubt we're all thinking back over the last 12 months, just in general terms. And perhaps for some of us, perhaps for all of us, but for some more than others, we think back over this year or previous years, and we think those years have got lost somehow. Missed opportunities, lost potential. And it's as though a locust has come to those years and he's destroyed our hopes and our joys and our pleasures. The locusts have come and all that we can see for our lives are a few remaining stumps and twigs that have been left behind because everything seems to have been ravaged. All that we hoped would come to pass has seems to gone, and all that we started the year with, well, it's not there, and it's been lost for some reason or another. And this is how it can be. We can begin a year with so much in our minds, so many intentions, so many plans, so many hopes, and we come to the end of that year, and it all seems to have disappeared. But it's a good opportunity, and it's a right thing that we should review our spiritual life, not just the ordinary events of life, but the spiritual life. And it's very possible, and it's even quite likely, that the locust has wreaked havoc. And the years have gone by, and there's little knowledge of God, little spiritual progress, and we think back, and all of that time that's been lost in a spiritual way, all those spiritual opportunities that seem to have disappeared. And it's a good thing, a right thing, that we should review our spiritual lives. Has the locust come and taken away that which was there? Has the locust come and removed all of our spiritual knowledge and our closeness with God 
and our walk with the Lord. Well, this verse refers to the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm. And some people think that they're different kinds of locust. Others think that they may be um, locusts in various stages of their development. But we won't get into all of that. That's overcomplicating the issue. And we don't want to get lost in all of the detail. But the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm are these insects that all cause loss and destruction. And they're various spiritual locusts that destroy the spiritual life of people in our world. And we need to be on the watch over these things. And I want to suggest some of these locusts that can come and do great damage to us in our own hearts and in our own souls. And we have to begin with the obvious one. There's a locust called sin. Now sin is a generic term for all disobedience and all rebellion against God. And it's the major pest and it's the culprit for so much spiritual destruction in the lives of people in our world. Sin, rebellion against God, doing that which is wrong in the sight of God, living lives that haven't got reference to God. You know, if we didn't know better, we just look at one locust, one solitary locust, there he is on his own, and he looks so small and so harmless. What can he do? And we look at sin like that and we think, well, what harm can that do? But the trouble with that one locust is that that one locust has a way of swarming with millions of others. And the one locust will suddenly gather together a whole army of locusts and before you know where you are, the entire countryside has been completely ravaged. And that's what sin does. We think about sin as being just one solitary thing, one disobedience against God. What harm can that do? But one sin has a way of bringing many, many others with it. And the sin that seems to swarm into our souls and across our lives is so destructive. And we look back and we see the devastation. How many people are in the world like that? Perhaps we think like that. Perhaps we can look back to a day when we just gave way in one sort of way or another. One sin. One sin. That's all it was. And yet it brought a whole multitude of other sins with it. And now we look back and one thing has led to another and led to another and led to another. And it's destroyed us. And it's done so much damage. There are people, no doubt, that are about in this city of Chichester today that can look back and say, if only I hadn't taken that first step, if only I hadn't disobeyed my conscience, if only I hadn't disobeyed what I'd been taught in my younger years, if only. And we now look back and look what's happened. So much damage has been caused, so many scars upon our lives and upon our souls. The locust of sin is deadly. It's deadly. And it's got a close relation. And we can call that unbelief. Now, locusts, it's said, just lay their eggs in quiet places where you wouldn't think to look. And you don't realise that they're there. And you don't realise, therefore, what trouble lies ahead. There's one theory about these locusts that Joel is talking about, that they come from one direction and they wreak their devastation, they lay their eggs, and when the eggs hatch, they go back into the direction that they've come, by which time the crops will have regrown and so forth, and they, so they're going backwards and forwards, as it were, doing damage wherever they go. And the eggs, you see, they're just laid there, and nobody realises. Nobody is appreciative of the damage and the destruction that lies in the future. And that's what unbelief is like. It lies there in our souls and we don't realise it. We don't realise that we don't trust God. We don't realise that we don't know God. 
we don't realise that we don't take serious regard <coughs> for God's word. There are his commands, there are his warnings, there are his invitations, and there are his promises, and we don't take them seriously. We come and hear these things over and over again in the house of God. We read our Bibles at home, I trust, and we read all about these things, but there's unbelief. We don't take it seriously. And there is that unbelief. It's sort of lying there. We don't realise it's there. And we don't understand what it will turn into and what it will lead to and what it will do to us. If we go through the whole of our lives with no true faith in God, we will look back and realise what that little egg did. And it will be utterly, utterly destructive to come to the end of life with no saviour and no future. It will be terrible. And the locust of unbelief is responsible for that. Well, sin, unbelief, has a helper, another locust, and we can call it worldliness. Worldliness. In other words, when we get so absorbed with the things of the moment, that's worldliness. Pleasures, plans, and our ordinary responsibility. And like a locust, it eats up all of our energy and takes up all of our time. You see, the locust doesn't spare the crops. It will go for the lot. And worldliness does that. Worldliness, the spirit of worldliness says, you need to be doing this. And you need to be there. And you need to be understanding so and so. And you need this pleasure. And you need that pastime. And if we're not careful, it eats up all of our time and all of our energy. And before we know where we are, we've given the whole of our lives, barring the few odd moments here and there, we've given the whole of our lives to things that belong to this world and not to the world that is yet to come. Now, I'm not saying that having a hobby is wrong. I like music, and I spend a little time listening to music or tinkling on the piano, that kind of a thing. But I hope it's not like a locust and it won't eat up everything. You know, I'll just give you that as an example. But, but these things can so take a grip over us, can't they, that it takes up everything, everything. Our jobs, our, our occupations, all of these things. Be careful that they are not like a locust and devour all of your energy, all of your time, the whole of your life. And again, you see, you get to the end of life and you realise that it's all gone. All gone. All that time that I could have spent in spiritual things, things that matter, things that count, it's all gone. And it's all been taken away by this locust called worldliness. Now, worldliness has got a close relation and it's called spiritual sloth. Not a very pleasant term, is it? It's an ugly name, spiritual sloth, but let me explain what it means. It's the kind of locust that eats up all of our spiritual intentions. I don't profess to be an expert on locusts, but I would imagine that for a hungry locust, a little shoot, you know, the little tender plants, look very appetizing, and it will go for those. It doesn't have to chew through the hard stems of an adult mature plant. The little shoots, the little green shoots that appear through the ground, the locust will take those away in an instant. And there are the intentions, the spiritual intentions that we have in our minds and in our hearts. As one year finishes and another year starts, how was it last year, friends? We meant to do so much. We were going to come to the church more. We were going to read our Bibles more faithfully and regularly. 
We were going to be more disciplined in our devotions at home, at home. All of these things. We were going to put things out of our lives and we were going to do this and we were going to do that. And it's just like a, a field of little shoots, little intentions that have sprung up. And what's happened over the year? Has the locusts come and devoured them all? And they're not there anymore. Nothing came of it. Nothing came of it. A year on, there ought to have been, from those spiritual intentions, those little shoots, mature plants by now, bearing fruit. But the locusts came along and scoffed the lot. And there's nothing left. And we're back where we were a year ago. And we've made no progress. There's no change. It's just as it was before. Great tragedy that, isn't it? And it's spiritual sloth. You know, we say to ourselves, well, yes, but it's hard. And it'll take effort. And I haven't got the time. And I can't make the time. And I've got these other things to do. We've got the energy for the one thing, but we haven't got the energy for the other. We've got all the intentions of doing our worldly things. Oh, that comes to something. But when it comes to spiritual matters, we haven't got the energy. We're too lazy. We can't put our backs into it. We don't pray over it. We don't think about it for long enough or seriously enough. And it's all gone. And it's all disappeared. And there's one final locust. And it's called careless presumption. I know it's a long name. But careless presumption. Let me explain what I mean by that. We hear a lot these days about sustainable commodities or renewable energy um, from where we live um, a bit further east from, from Chichester they put a lot of um, these um, um, windmill things out in the sea off the coast seven or eight miles off the coast and there's two or three hundred of them you can see them from the, from the, from the, from the coast quite clearly and it's renewable energy in other words it's driven by wind and it's not reliant upon fossil fuels or natural gas or anything of that kind. And the idea is that it will always be there. The wind will always be there. It will always drive the, drive the turbines and you will always be able to get the electricity. Or sustainable commodities. Buy, um, buy your foodstuffs from sustainable sources. That's what we're being, all, all we're being told to do. And if we do that, it'll always be there, you see. The fish will be there in the sea and, and so on and so forth. And the energy will be able to be harvested from the wind and we'll be able to go on and on and on and we'll never run out. And we think that time is like that. It's a sustainable commodity, a renewable energy. It'll always be there, we think. We've always got time. Time is always on our side. But it's not, is it? It's not renewable. You can't bring it back when it's gone. When it's gone, it's gone. It's gone forever. And the problem is that it's like a locust, this attitude. And we stand by and we watch. That's what we do. We watch as the locust eats up all the years. And we convince ourselves, yes, but there'll be another year and another year, and another year, but there won't be, won't be. We'll get to the point when the locust has eaten up all the years and there won't be any more, and we'll end up in a terrible state right there at the end. So there are all these kinds of locusts that do so much damage and cause so much destruction. And I'm painting a pretty bleak picture here, it's a miserable kind of a condition, isn't it? If we look back and, and see what's happened to us in these regards. Perhaps we look again this morning and we think of our spiritual standing, how we are before the Lord, where we are before the Lord. And do we look back and we, do we see what the, what the locusts have done? Do we see what's happened to us? Do we realise that we should have turned to the Lord. We could have turned to the Lord. We meant to have turned to the Lord. But the locust has come. And it's all gone. I could have known his salvation. But I haven't. 
I could and I should have committed my way to him, but I didn't. I should have been following him over these last months and years, but I haven't been. It all could have been so different, but the locusts, they've got me and they've destroyed my spiritual life and there's nothing there. I've got no knowledge of God, I've got no peace in my heart, I've got no solid hope for the future. The locusts have taken all of these things away. So there are the years, and that's what the locusts do, but here's the promise. Verse 25, the Lord says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you, I will restore them. I will restore to you the years. Well, what does that mean? How does God do a thing like that? Well, what he doesn't mean is this. He doesn't mean that he will turn the clock back. You know, if we're 30 years old or 40 years old, we go back to when we're 20 and we can relive those years. That's not what the Lord means. And he doesn't mean either that he will undo all the mistakes and remove the scars and the effects left upon us by the locusts. Not in that sense. What he means by this, what the word really means, that he will make amends or compensate or make up for those years that the locust hath eaten up. Now, how does he do that? Well, the first thing, and this is the most important thing, and listen to this because this is so important, the first way, the first thing that needs to be done, the first means that God uses, is when we seriously listen to the gospel, and I mean seriously, when we turn to him. Don't be like last year when we meant to and intended to, but never did. Do it. Turn to the Lord. Repent of your sin and turn to the Lord. Trust in the Saviour. Give yourselves up and unto God. This is the great thing. This is where it begins. You'll read this again, perhaps when you get home later on. And there are these warnings, but there are the calls to repentance and to faith. And then there are the promises. But we've got to turn to the Lord first and give ourselves unto him and ask him that he will help us as we resolve to live in his way and in faith in him. Turning unto God, that's the great thing and the first thing. But then how does the Lord from there restore the years that the locust have eaten? Well, he does that in this way to begin with, by making our remaining years altogether different. He makes our remaining years altogether different. He can restore our relationship with him in a way that will overshadow a whole lifetime of rebellion. And he can do that. Now right now, we may be sitting here this morning and thinking about all of the ways in which we have rebelled, broken his law, forgotten him, not taken him seriously, and look where it's got us. And we mourn that, and we regret that deeply, and we're very penitent and repentant about all of that. But God can so restore our relationship with himself that all of that will be overshadowed, and it will become a thing of the past, and it's as though those things almost never were. He can give us such a joy and a peace in a f for a few years that will utterly eclipse a whole lifetime of unhappiness. He restores the years in that way. And then the Lord can compress a lifetime of spiritual usefulness into a short space of time. You know that when someone's converted, especially when in later in life, when someone's really converted, what they tend to do is to look back and say, oh, if only, if only, if only I'd come to the Lord earlier. My life could have been different. 
I wouldn't have made the mistakes that I've made, but I would have been able to do so much. I would have been able to do so much for the Lord, give so much to him. My life could have been useful, and it hasn't been. The locust has eaten it all up, and it's been a waste. But what God can do in those even few years that remain is make your life so useful to him, so full of meaning and so full of purpose that it kind of makes up for all the lost years. Let me give you an example in the scriptures. You know, when Jesus was crucified on Calvary, there were the two thieves on either side. And I often refer to this, but you know, they were both insulting him. The, the word in the Bible we read is they were railing against him. They were shouting at him and they were accusing him and they were ridiculing him and they were abusing him. And they were criminals and they wasted their lives. And yet one of them watches and hears the words of Jesus, watches how he conducts himself in his agony upon the cross, hears the things that he's saying upon the cross, and that thief is converted. And he says to the Lord Jesus, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And the Lord said to him, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. He was converted, he was saved, right at the last moment. Now, his whole life had been an ungodly life, so far as we know. A really ungodly life to the extent that he had been caught for his criminal activities and was being put to death because of what he'd done, the kind of person that he'd been. And yet, what the Lord did in the last few hours of his life, and that's all it was, wasn't on that cross for very long before he died, before the soldiers came along and broke the legs of the, the two thieves to make sure that they were dead. Wasn't there for long. But what are we doing this morning? We're listening to an account of his conversion and those words that he said upon the cross have been repeated over and over and over and over and over again for more than 2,000 years. So the Lord restored the years that the locust had eaten for him. He'd wasted, the locust had wasted the whole of his life. But those last few hours, the Lord converted him and saved him and made him such a witness and a testimony to the saving grace of God that those few hours completely overshadowed and more than compensated for all those years of waste. Incredible, isn't it? Incredible what God can do. I will restore unto you the years that the locust hath eaten. Oh, I don't think there'll be any one of us this morning, Christian or not, that looks back without regrets that looks back and can say, I did everything I could have done with my life. None of us have done that. There's only one man that ever did that, and that was Jesus Christ. The rest of us are not at that level, nowhere near it. And we look back and we say, oh, if this, oh, if that, if I come to the Lord earlier, or if I'd be more faithful to the Lord over all of the lives, my, the years of my life, if I hadn't given way to temptation, if I hadn't sinned, if I hadn't backslidden, if I hadn't done this, if the locusts hadn't come for one reason or another, and in one way or another, how different it could have been. And if we're not careful, we get stuck in a kind of rut of despair and regret and despondency. When all the time the Lord says, I will restore the years that the locust hath eaten. I'll make up for them. I can take you as you are. Yes, your life has been a waste thus far, but I can take you. 
and I will save you, and I will make the rest of your life so different, so meaningful, so full of purpose, so glorious, so good. And even like the thief who was on the cross, your words and your witness and your testimony can become a wonderful thing in the service and in the hands of God. And one last application of this is, is in this way. That the Lord will give us, as he restores the lost years, a heavenly reward as great as would be the reward for a whole lifetime of faith. Now there are degrees of reward, but the main thing is that heaven awaits those who know the Saviour. And whether it's early in life or whether it's late in life, heaven, in all its glory, is given as a reward, so to speak, for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we read from Matthew 20. You remember that parable? The vineyard owner went out early in the morning because it was time for the harvest to be brought in and he wanted labourers. So he goes out early and he recruits labourers and he says, I'll pay you a penny. That was a day's wages in those days. Doesn't seem like very much nowadays, but that's, that was the going rate for a day's labour. I'll pay you a penny for a day's labour. And then he goes out three hours later and then hours later on than that and then to the 11th hour of the day which would be about five o'clock in the afternoon now just before the sun sets and it's too too late to work and he finds more people standing around doing nothing and he says what are you doing there don't stand around like that help in my vineyard and i will pay you and at the end of the day, when all the work has been done, he gathers everything, everyone together, and he starts by paying those that didn't start work until the 11th hour. Just kind of a, a, an hour to go before the sunlight fades and, and the work day finishes. And he gives them a penny. And those that have been working all day say to, say to him, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're giving them a penny, and that's what we're going to get. Well, if they're going to get a penny for doing an hour's work, we deserve more than that. That's not fair. And, he's, and, and the owner of the vineyard said, well, you agreed to work for a, for a penny for the whole day, and that's what I'm giving you. That's fair. And isn't it my right to give those that have been working all day a penny? And isn't it my right to give those that have been working just an hour a penny too? That's my right. Well, the point there is that, or one point there is that whether we come to salvation early or whether we come to salvation late, heaven is the reward. The thief on the cross is in heaven just as much as the Apostle Paul is in heaven after all those years that he spent in the service of God. And it may be the eleventh hour for us. All the day, all the years have been wasted by the locusts. But if we come to Christ today, don't talk about tomorrow, come today and commit your way to him and resolve to believe in him and to live for him, putting away all other things that might get into the way, heaven will be yours and the reward will be enormous. I will restore to you the years that the locust have eaten. Let's not sit in despair, despondency, heavy-hearted because of regrets. Yes, let's confess our sins to the Lord, but let's trust him for his promise to more than compensate for the years that have gone if only we will come and give ourselves up to Christ. May the Lord help us to do that. Amen.